going to back up just a bit to the beginning of Hamlet's long speech in Act 3 at the beginning, which I'm not going to call a soliloquy uh, because it's not. <clears throat> so just before that, we're told by a stage direction that the king and Polonius exit. But bear in mind, twice now when they've discussed this setup, okay, where Polonius is going to lose his daughter on Hamlet, it's said that they're going to hide behind an heiress. And in, again, both those scenes where they discuss this setup, it was said where we will be able to overhear, see being unseen what occurs. Okay? So, Ophelia's on the stage. She's walking around with a book. She, she looks, you know, like she's full of devotion and prayer and such. And Hamlet walks in. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Those four lines are about what two choices? Two choices to confront the difficulties of life. What are they? One of them is kind of alluded to in the very question. To confront them. To face up to them. Okay? That's the to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. The other option or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing into them. Suicide. Okay? To die. So he's talking about the second option. So here's what happens. To die. To sleep. No more. What's the no more? What do we sometimes mean by the word more? You'll see it in advertising all the time. Buy this and get this and this and this and more. No more means nothing else. To die, to sleep, silence. Interestingly, Hamlet's last words are, the rest is silence. Okay? That, no more slings and arrows. And by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Notice the two things that he mentions there that flesh is heir to, or that life is heir to. Meaning that if you live, you will experience these things. First one he mentions, heartache. Why? What has Ophelia stopped doing? She stopped all conversation with Hamlet. Okay? The thousand natural shocks the flesh is heir to? It's getting old or getting older. That's pains. Tis a consummation. Consummation doesn't just mean in. It means completion, a finishing, a fulfillment, okay? Devoutly to be wished. St. Paul said for him and for Christians, he's suggesting, to die is to be with Christ. And he says, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to it, but not what I will, paraphrasing kind of Jesus, he says, if God wants me to keep living, then I'll keep living. But I really want to be there in the other world. To die, to sleep. So Hamlet continues with the metaphor. You know, go to a grave, go to a cemetery, and you will see at least one gravestone with the old RIP. What is that word, what is that phrase, that acronym literally stand for? Requiescat in pacem. 
which means rest in peace. Rest. Sleep. Because rest implies what? You're going to get up. It's not total. It's not permanent. Okay? To die, to sleep. Because sleep is an image used everywhere for death. Well, what happens when you sleep? To sleep. Perchance to dream. Ay, there's the rub. Why? Why is dreaming bad? What does he tell Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? I could be a king of infinite space bounded by a nutshell were it not that I have bad dreams. And I think it is Rosencrantz says, and that dream is the substance of your ambition. And Hamlet goes on and talks about dreams. Okay, so now he's brought up dreams. What dreams may come, what? In that sleep of death. Okay, so you're in the grave and you dream. Dream of what? That's his point. What do we know is after death? We look out this door right now. I used this image the other day. And you can look down that way, down the hallway, and down that way, down the hallway. We, we can look and see what's outside. Close the door. Imagine there's no window or no vent, and then it's death, because you can't take a peek and then pull back. Though I just saw an article the other day, didn't read it, saw the headline. You know, what all kinds of people have said they've seen when they've been clinically dead, anywhere from like one to 15 minutes, and then revived. What dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, the flesh, must give us pause. That is, thinking about what may be after death must give us pause. Pause for what? Pause for suicide? There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. We've got a gloss down there that's on age 69. So, stupid gloss. So long life, it means long lived. Gee, really? A moron could have told you that. What they should have glossed is calamity. How can a long life be a calamity? I'll tell you right now, I'm 61. I do not want to live past 80. For the simple reason, I saw what happened to both my parents <laughs> when they lived past 80. They were both relatively sharp at 80. But after 80, both of them, Alzheimer's, really set in. Nope, don't even want to go there. I'd be fine even 75. Because the longer you live, the more this kind of stuff happens too. There's the respect. That is, the respect of what? Of fearing what comes after that makes calamity of so long life. And then he asks the question, who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Time. Time is a favorite theme in Shakespeare. It's really important in his sonnets because he talks throughout the sonnets of time wearing everything down. I don't know if you've ever been out west. Go to the Rockies. Go to the Sierra Nevadas. Both are relatively new mountain ranges. Compare those with the Smokies. The Smokies are very old, like three billion, if I remember correctly. Really, really old mountains. The Rockies and the Sierras are a few hundred million years old, okay? Time wears everything down. The whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong. And I know some people, a lot of people today think they're, a lot of people in the United States today, I'm going to get on a soapbox here, think they're oppressed. They have no idea what oppression is. They have no real idea. you got to go somewhere like North Korea to understand real, real oppression. Or Cuba. Go down to Cuba, stand on a street, and rail against the Castro brothers. 
you won't be standing on the street long. Go to North Korea and say Kim Jong Un is a fat, stupid man, and you won't be speaking for very long. Okay. What's he mean by the oppressor's wrong? Here, that doesn't just mean political oppression. It could be as simple as a boss beating down an employee, not physically, you know, taking away perks, giving extra hours, that kind of thing. The oppressor's wrong. The proud man's contumely. That is, the proud man's condescension, looking down his or her nose at the other person. The pangs of despised love. And if I were directing a version of this play, when Hamlet says the pangs of, of despised love, he would look at Ophelia. My reading, Hamlet knows Ophelia is there. He doesn't walk out like this and just never see her. The laws delay. We have a phrase in American society. Justice delayed is justice denied. The insolence of office and the spurns, the patient merit of the unworthy takes. And he's suggesting there that somehow the unworthy are accounted meritorious. We could go off onto that. When he himself, that is, the person who suffers these things, could do what? Might his quietus make his own death with a bare bodkin? A bare bodkin is just a little knife. Take it out, slit one's throat, slit one's wrist, stab oneself in the heart, done. Who would fardels bear? Fardels. Burdens. Who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death? <laughs> That's what keeps people going. I mean, take all the stuff I just mentioned, throw it out the window. Put yourself in Auschwitz, 1944. Because there are an awful lot, even today, not today nearly as many, but in 1945, 1946, 1947, there were an awful lot of Auschwitz survivors, or Bergen Belsen, or Dachau, or any of the other dozen concentration camps. How did they keep going? Just think of that. And if you think the Nazi camps were bad, and I'm not a proto-Nazi or anything like that, don't miss me. Don't misunderstand me. Nothing compared to the Soviet Union's gulag system throughout Siberia. Absolutely nothing. Hitler killed six million Jews. Stalin killed, conservatively, killed 20 million Russians. A lot of people think it's more like 60 million. So who would grunt and sweat under a weary life? <laughs> Those kinds of situations. But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born, no traveler returns. No one comes back. Puzzles the will. What's the will? Volition. The sense of, I'm going to. OK? Another word that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern might use for it is ambition. Or ambition is what prompts the will to do something. The fear of this, he says, does what? It puzzles the will. What is it? We don't use the word puzzle usually as a verb. We use it solely as a noun. Like something what? Broken into a bunch of pieces and you try to put it together. So take that and apply it to the will. It does what? It fractures it. It says, whoa, stop, not sure what to do. Puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have, right? Better the devil we know 
than the one we don't, bears those ills we have that fly to others we don't know of. What? Throughout the speech, what is Hamlet suggesting? We don't know what lies behind that door. And uh, I said before we, when we began discussing Hamlet, it's Shakespeare's most religious play. What does the ghost say? For him, at least, lies behind the door. Purgatory. He's getting his sins burned off throughout the day. And at night, he wanders, you know, the countryside, etc. That's one answer. The Protestant answer is, there is no purgatory. You die, guess what? <laughs> one of the two. Okay? Puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those hills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. Conscience, gloss, quote, probably inhibition by the faculty of reason restraining the will from doing wrong. Is it the reason that necessarily strays the will from doing wrong, that keeps the will from doing wrong? We don't tend to, today, we don't tend to attribute that to reason we attribute that to the conscience. The conscience is what is inside that says, don't do this, do this. <laughs> conscience, he says, makes cowards of us all. Hamlet's first soliloquy. After the first two lines, line three was what? Or that the Almighty had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. Conscience. Is it okay to kill oneself? Within both the Catholic Church and pretty much Shakespeare's day, the Protestant form of Christianity, suicide is always off the table. It is never allowed. In fact, the Catholic Church said, it is the unforgivable sin. You commit suicide, you go straight to hell. No chance of mercy. Absolutely none. Why? Because you don't even give God the opportunity to show you mercy. Because suicide is a means of saying two things to God. One, the middle finger. <laughs> and that's only because my problems are too big for God to handle. Okay? Okay. And thus, the native hue of resolution is sickling o'er with the pale cast of thought. I'm afraid to look at hue. Natural color. Native hue of resolution is not the natural color of your face. The natural color of your face is the color of your faces right now. But right, right now, none of you are really resolved to do something. What if you were? What if I so got in your face to really anger you? What would be the native hue of your resolution? What color would your face become? More than likely. Red, with anger in that instance. What if you're doing something that is physically extremely hard? Your car breaks down. You're in an inside lane or in the middle lane. You got to get your car to the inside median or the outside emergency lane. What do you have to do? Hopefully there's two people. You got to push it, right? What happens when you do that kind of struggle? I had to do it more than once in my life. Your face turns beet red from all the effort. Why? Because all that blood. <laughs> you know, he's saying that's the native hue of resolution. And it does what? It gets sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. Because people who are sick often look how? Pale. 
Blood has drained from their faces. He says, what does this? Thought. Because what does thought tend to do? See, conscience says good, bad. Sorry, good, bad. Left is sinister. Good, bad. Thought says, well, hold on there. Maybe not. Especially 21st century. You know, everything's thought black and white. There's all kinds of shades of gray. Maybe this is okay in some instances, etc. And what happens to that will? Enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard that is looking at it, you know, kind of objectively and thinking the ramification, blah, 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 blah. With this regard, their currents turn awry. What's a current? Think of like a river current or stream or even an electrical current. It goes from here to here without deviation. This current, however, because of thought, goes awry. It goes off course and loses the name of action. What did he say in his previous somewhat long, it's about 20 or 30 lines, soliloquy after meeting, I take that back, it's a lot longer, 20 or 30 lines, about 50 or 60 lines, after meeting the actors. He beats himself up. Why? Because he's like, oh, what a roving peasant slave am I. Because I haven't acted. Hamlet knows he hasn't fulfilled his pledge. Avenge you? No problem. We're being told through these soliloquies why he's thinking. At the end of that speech, what not the to be or not to be, the other soliloquy, the previous one, what does he say? I've heard it said that guilty people, when their action is done in front of them, they reveal themselves. And he finishes it with the place that they were in, I'll catch the conscience of a king. So he is going to create this, this part of this play for what purpose? To make Claudius reveal himself. That's not the real purpose. What's the real purpose? He says, then I'll have grounds more relative. I'll be on firmer ground to do what? To kill him. Hamlet's thinking, I can't kill him just on the basis of the words of a ghost. Because in that speech, he says, maybe it's not a ghost. Maybe it's a spirit from hell trying to damn me. That's part of his Christian thinking kicking in. Okay? Soft, you now. The pharophilia. Nymph! And he should, at that point, speak more loudly. Okay? In thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Orisons, prayers. Why? Because she's walking around with what looks like a prayer book. And he's saying, remember me in your prayers. But that's not what he said. He said, in your prayers be all my sins remembered. Is he telling her, Ophelia, when you pray to God, say, and God, remember that Hamlet, Hamlet is jealous. Remember that he's proud. Remember that he's, and start listing off his sins. Because that would be kind of a way of going, in God, damn Hamlet for these things. Or does he mean God forgive Hamlet for? He means the latter, by the way. Good, my Lord. How does your honor for this many a day? This many a day is telling us what? How long have they talked to each other? It's not just been one or two days. The passage of time from when Polonius tells Ophelia, make your presence scarce from Hamlet. It's been days. Okay? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. 
Uh, my Lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed to re-deliver. I, I pray you now receive them. And she pulls out of a pocket somewhere in her dress, she pulls out the sheaf of papers to Hamlet, to hand to Hamlet. Not I. I, I never gave you one. They're not for me. My honored Lord, you know right well you did. And with them, words of so sweet breath composed as made the thing more rich. What is that betraying on Ophelia's part? Oh, Hamlet. Man, do you have a way with words. But with breath so sweet composed, there's a word that we can use to, a, one, a single word that we can use to describe that. Inspired. Inspired, not by God, by Hamlet. So that when she reads those words, it's like breathing in Hamlet. What's she telling us? Oh, you had me, ma'am. <laughs> you had me hook, line, and sinker. As made the things more rich, their perfume lost. That is, the words, they no longer have that smell of that sweet breath. Take these again. She holds them out. Why? Their perfume is lost. They no longer mean anything to me. Why? Who told her not to believe them? Hamlet? Gertrude? Polonius. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. She's telling Hamlet, I believed what you told me. But now I know you didn't mean a word of this. Because what does she now think Hamlet wanted when he wrote those? Sex. That was it. Hamlet. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? And notice you've got a gloss for the word honest. This is actually a fairly good one. It's like 102 or so. Are you honest? Honest meaning truthful as well as chaste. Okay? Are you honest, my lord? Are you fair? Okay? You've got a gloss. Fair meaning just, honorable, and beautiful. He ain't since out of sleep, just let him sleep. So, are you honest, chaste, and honest? And are you fair? Beautiful. Okay. What means you're... Where are you going, Hamlet? It's like, non sequitur here. We were talking about other stuff, and now... Good. If you be honest and fair, chaste, honest, and beautiful, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Okay. Discourse to... Familiar intercourse with, that is, talking. Okay. So he says, your honesty, your chastity, and your truthfulness should admit no discourse back and forth with your beauty. Your chastefulness, your truthfulness should do what? He's saying it should protect your beauty. Build a wall. Keep others away. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Shouldn't beauty have conversation with truthfulness and chastity? She's suggesting. Hamlet, truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty, again, chastity and truthfulness, from what it is, chastity, 
truthfulness to a bawd. Use a word that he used to describe Polonius, a fishmonger, a pimp. From what it is to a bawd, then the force of honesty, chastity, truthfulness, can translate beauty into his likeness. That is, honesty can't transform beauty into chastity and truthfulness. Hamlet is saying beauty in and of itself, it's ambiguous. It's neutral. It can lead to righteousness, let's say, honesty, chastity, or truthfulness, chastity, or it can lead to sin. This was sometime a paradox, but now the tongue gives a proof. I did love you once. Notice the two time words there. Did, once. They both emphasize past, not now. Indeed, my Lord, you made me believe so. How? All the papers she's holding. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Okay, look at your gloss down there. Inoculate, graft, metaphorical. What's meant by graft? Here's a tree trunk. Here's another tree trunk. It's got branches that go off and go up, okay? This one, the branch here has been cut like that. But then this branch goes up and this branch goes off. You can take this branch and do that and cut it off and put it on here, wrap tape around there, let's say, this is a peach tree. This is a plum tree. You will get, once this grows together and heals, you will get plums off of these branches and peaches off of that branch. That's grafting. Or you can have a modern day surgical skin graft kind of a thing. All right? <coughs> Look at the language Hamlet uses again. It cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Our old stock, your gloss, that we do not still, still have about us a taste of the old stock, i.e. retain our sinfulness. Old stock can also refer to Think of this as one tree. You know, how do, how do genealogists portray family histories? The genealogical tree. Okay? You have the stock, or two stocks, you know, great, 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 grandmother, great, 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 grandfather. Go all the way back. Adam, Eve. Old stock. St. Paul, throughout the New Testament, and Jesus even a few times, refers to the old Adam. The early church fathers called Jesus the new Adam. Mary, the new Eve. Okay? The new Adam replaces the old Adam. How? The old Adam dies, and through the process of baptism, is reborn. Okay? St. Paul's letters are an awful lot about just that. We cannot, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock. What does he mean? Just behaving well, just behaving virtuously cannot overcome the old stock or the old Adam of, to use St. Augustine's 
terminology, which I think we've used before, of original sin. Adam and Eve screwed up. According to St. Augustine, that essentially gets passed on genetically so that everybody, according to Augustine, according to the Catholic Church, is guilty of the sin of Adam and Eve. That guilt gets passed on. Okay? Hamlet's saying, no matter how virtuously you act, that doesn't wipe this out. Okay? Christianity says something else has to wipe that out. And there's a Catholic approach to wiping it out, and there's a Protestant approach to wiping it out. By the way, ultimately, both go back to Christ. Okay? Notice, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stuff, but we shall relish of it. <clears throat> Think minister's black veil. He delivers that first sermon wearing the veil. What's it about? so long ago. Secret sin. And what's, why is the sin secret? Is it just because I don't want all of you to know? Partially. But it's according to the play, uh, the story, it's the one thing everybody says, no, 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 God, you can have all these sins back. I'll confess all of these. But this one, this one's mine. <laughs> you know, I'm going to cherish, hold on to this one thing. That's what the relishing of it gets at. I can become a quote-unquote full-blown evangelical uh, born-again Christian, etc. But there's still part of me that harkens back. In other words, still sin. Nowhere does the New Testament say Become a Christian and you won't, you'll never sin again. Just look at St. Paul okay. as an example of how that's not true. I loved you not. Notice, I did love you once. You made me believe so. He finishes this little part with, I loved you not. So which is it? The, the did... In the first phrase, I did love you once. That implies two things. One, passage of time. That was a go, not now. But what else is it? It's emphatic. I did love you, Ophelia. Now he says, I loved you not. Put yourself in Ophelia's shoes and assume for a moment you really loved Hamlet. What's he doing with their mind? Messing with it. Playing games with it. Okay. So let me ask a good question. Is he playing games with it sincerely? In other words, does Hamlet really mean to Ophelia what he's saying? Hold on to that. She says, I was the more deceived. Why? What is she implying without coming out directly, overtly, explicitly saying it? I loved you too. I loved you too. I was the more deceived. Why? I believed every word of it. Get thee to a nunnery. What did he tell Polonius, in the fishmonger scene. You have a daughter? Uh-huh. Let her get to the nunnery. Why? She, you don't want her walking around in the sun because she might conceive maggots. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? And we're back to the maggots, right? I am myself indifferent, honest. Moderately virtuous. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. That's like being partly pregnant. Mm, no. Either are or are not. Moderately virtuous. Ben Franklin, read the autobiography of Ben Franklin if you never have. Ben Franklin famously tried to become a more moral person by in his daily diary 
taking note of the quote unquote sins he had done, okay, and trying not to do it the next day. And then the next day, he would, you know, I was good in this, 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 and this way, but I still failed this, this. And the upshot of it is Franklin realized, can't do it. Can't become quote unquote moral just by this, okay? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. We don't know what things he's talking about. I'm very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck, that is my call, my voice, than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, and there we are, back to Theseus, you know. Then I, um, or time to act them in. What does he mean? I'm rotten. I am rotten. I am very proud, chief of sins, according to the Catholic Church, revengeful, ambitious, more offenses at my word, at my mouth. What does James say in the book of James? What is the most, the worst part of the human being? This thing. Why? Because out of this come blessing and cursing and imagination to give them shape or time to. I, man, Hamlet saying, I am so rotten inside. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? Crawling. Not standing upright, not walking. Why does he call fellows such as he crawling? What do maggots do on carrion? They crawl. This, I think, I could be wrong. Shakespeare might be suggesting a bit of Calvinism, named after... John Calvin, who I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit more later, founder of the Reformed Church, which becomes the Presbyterian Church and such. And Calvin had some very specific dogmas in his belief system. Central to those was this. Total depravity. Everybody is totally depraved. Now, he didn't mean by that. We all walk around every day with our minds completely, totally in the gutter. He means that every aspect of our being, everything we do, everything we say, everything we think is, to use the language the ghost uses, tainted by sin. Thus, no one ever does anything that is entirely good. You help somebody, there's a part of you that is doing it for yourself. To make you feel good, maybe. Okay? We are errant knaves. Errant means wandering, directionless, not having a destination. We are errant knaves all. Look at his next line. Believe none of us. That's an absolutist statement. And by that I mean, what does it suggest? Who's the us, by the way? He's talking about men. He's not talking about humanity. He's talking about men, specifically. Believe none of us. Well, who does that include? Himself. The person who says there are no such thing as absolutes has just proven the invalidity of their statement. Why? Because saying there are no such thing as absolutes, that is an absolutist statement. <laughs> That's black or white. It doesn't allow for anything else. Okay. 
paradox, oxymoron, however you want to look at it. Might Hamlet be saying when he says, believe none of us, might this be his, might, I'm not saying it is. His way of saying, Ophelia, don't even believe what I'm telling you now. I mean, believe none of us means don't believe anything any man tells you. He's just told her a lot. What specifically has he told her? That makes sense, in a sense. I did love you once. I loved you not. Believe none of us. The did once implies I no longer love you. So if she is not to believe him, I do love you. I loved you not. Don't believe me. I do love you. What does he tell her? Go thy ways to a nunnery. Why? Where's your father? Where is her father? Where is Polonius right now when Hamlet asks this question? He's behind an heiress. I know the stage direction says exeunt, but we were told they were going to be behind the heiress where they could listen. Okay? What does she say? At home, my lord. Do you think Hamlet knows where he is? Do you think Hamlet has a guess? Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. What's he mean? And, possibly, what's he saying? Let him close the door and behind himself when he goes into his own house. Why? Because you can be a damn fool in your own house. And nobody will know, right? What else? You can be a fool in your own house and what won't happen to you? You won't get hurt. See, my reading, and I'm not saying this is right. I don't. I, I've not read a lot of a lot of scholarship on Hamlet, so I don't know what others say. I think this is the case, though. I think Hamlet is warning Polonius here. I think Hamlet knows he is being watched, and he's just kind of saying, "And if anybody out there can hear me, Polonius." Keep your nose in your own business. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. Why does Ophelia say that? She thinks Hamlet's lost it. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. What was the dowry? It's what the father gave when to the husband-to-be when the daughter married, okay? Like a bank account that went with her. Here's what I'll give you for your dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Calumny, people saying bad things about you. Okay, so chaste as ice, pure as snow, implying what? Frigid, not having sex in marriage, okay? He says, no matter whether you consummate the marriage with your husband or not, people are still going to say things. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. Farewell. He's kind of like he's going, get. <laughs> or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. Why? For wise men know well enough what monsters you you, not you, Ophelia, you, women, make of them. What kind of monsters? Shakespeare slash Hamlet is playing on an old idea from the Middle Ages up to this time. And that idea is that women 
cannot be sexually satisfied with one man. Wives are going to do what? Husband goes off to work, and she's going to follow him out the door to go next door to the neighbor. Or she's going to throw the door wide open and say, all comers. There's a, a, um, one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. It's, uh, I think, the wife of Bastille. I may, may be wrong about that. But anyway, the implication is, you know, the door is open and there is a path beat to the door by all the wife's lovers coming in. Okay? To a nunnery. Go! Quickly! Why, why does he keep to a nunnery? Is it to find Jesus, to marry Jesus, you know, which is what a nun supposedly does? Is it that? Or is it get away from the presence of men? I've heard of your paintings, too. He's not talking about portraiture. He's talking about women painting their faces, cosmetics. And this could be, don't, I don't really think it is, but it could be kind of a, a little dig at Queen Elizabeth, who at this point, she was in her 60s. And she was kind of beginning the process of dying. She dies in 1603, okay? Who painted her face white. God has given you one face, that is, the face you're born with, and you make yourselves another. Get on social media. Get on, you know, reality shows. You make yourself, I just read a thing yesterday, and I have no idea who this person is. I don't even know how to pronounce her name. Black, B-L-A-C, C-H-Y-N-A. Is it Black China? Black China? Whatever. Per Chi, apparently, last year, became a Christian, got baptized, and just in the last few weeks, she's gone through medical procedures to undo all the medical procedures she had done before. Like four times breast implants, face, whatever you do to your face, stuff with her butt and everything. I mean, one of the things she said, you know, it normally takes two hours to do this, to undo this procedure in the hospital. I was there for eight hours. So, a lot of work. Why? Undoing the painting, so to speak. You jig, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll know more on it. It have made me mad. He just said, it's because of the way you women act that have made me mad. Ophelia? Or another woman? Frailty, thy name is woman. Hamlet says about his mother in his first soliloquy. Why? Because she so quickly jumped into her brother-in-law's bed. We will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. Who's the all but one? Claudius. Hamlet's telling us, the audience, he's telling Ophelia, one person that is currently married, that person's going to die. Okay? I think this is a, to me, this is another reason why I think Hamlet knows exactly what is happening right here. He knows he's being watched. And that's his little, you know, tidbit to Claudius. You better keep an eye on me. Hamlet leaves. Soliloquy? Ophelia's alone on the stage. Enter King and Polonius next. I don't know if that enter means they pull the heiress back, or they come striding out through a doorway. If I were directing it, the heiress comes, gets pulled back. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier soldiers, soldier, scholars, eye, tongue, sword. And what she means by that is Hamlet is the model, the thing to be emulated of all of these. The courtier, the soldier, the scholar. His eye, his tongue, his sword. He's the perfection of these. 
the expectancy and rose of the fair state. That is, everybody looks to Hamlet to inherit the kingship. The glass of fashion, nobody looks like Hamlet does when he dresses to the nines. And the mold of form, that is, his body is perfect. Even though later on we're going to be told that he's kind of pudgy. He's out of shape. Why? Because he's lost his desire. The absurd, and there it is, the observed of all observers. And that's telling us a couple of things. Everybody is looking at Hamlet. Talk about living in a fishbowl. Okay? But what else? What else is she saying about Danish society? Everybody is doing what? Kind of like in the society in Milford, Massachusetts, where ministers black veil is. Everybody is looking at everybody else. What is nobody doing? looking inward. And I have ladies most eject and wretched that suck the honey of his music vows. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh. A woe is me to have seen what I have seen. That is Hamlet in his right mind and gorgeous. And to see what I see. Hamlet down. I know it's 10.05, just once, uh, it's 8.56, just one question. King, love? <laughs> His affections do not that way tend. What does that line tell us? And the next, nor what he spake. Heard every word. Not a soliloquy. Okay, we'll stop there. I'm going to put up a uh, quiz. Even though we haven't finished Act 3. We'll finish Act 3 on Wednesday, definitely. But I'll put up a quiz of, uh, over Act 3, and I'll make it do Thursday night.